Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Hi, Spencer. Um, yeah, so if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn with me to 2 Corinthians 4. Today we'll be focusing most of our attention on verses 7 to 18. Um, you know, it's funny and interesting to hear what Brian and Mark chose to speak about over the last couple of weeks, uh, because I also chose to speak on, on the topic of, of suffering, and this was long before I knew what they were speaking about. And, and so it seems that the Holy Spirit is, is highlighting this topic for us as a church. If you remember two weeks ago, Brian showed us from the word that suffering came into the world because of Adam and Eve's choice, the fall, as Steve mentioned. And because of that disobedience against God, um, God responding in his perfect justice placed creation under a curse. And now because of that curse, there is unavoidable suffering in this life. But in all of our suffering, God, who is all-powerful and infinitely wise, is in control of all of it, and we can trust him. And then last week, Mark focused on how we are to love each other as Christians, and that our love for each other is a witness to the world. Mark also recognized that it's not always that easy, and that because of the effects of our own sin and that of others, we suffer much in our relationships. This can leave us frustrated, hurt, angry, and at times confused. And so in our lives, there's, there's all this suffering. But what I want to focus on today using 2 Corinthians 4 is what Paul says in Romans 8, verse 18, when he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And if anyone of you know Paul, and if there is anyone apart from Christ who can speak about suffering, it certainly is the Apostle Paul. I mean, let's just take a look at his resume over the course of his 30-year ministry. Five times he received the 40 lashes, less one, three times beaten with rods, in one instant being beaten so badly it literally left his spine exposed, once pummeled with stones, shipwrecked three times, adrift at sea, dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, and even his own people. He experienced dangers in the cities he visited, danger in the wilderness, many sleepless nights, hungry and thirsty often, left to, the, to sleep in the cold with nothing to cover him. And then on top of all that, there was the daily uh, pressure of anxiety for all the churches he pastored. But in spite of all that, he says something outrageous. He says that this suffering is light. I don't always understand what Paul means by that. Um, so let's read from 2 Corinthians 4 and then let Paul show us some reasons why he can say that. Starting in verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what, he has, or according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, and we also believe and so we also speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. 
So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So, as I mentioned, what I want us to do is just look at, a, at some reasons why Paul can consider his daily suffering light. The first reason is that Paul saw, his per, or Paul saw purpose in his suffering because as he became physically weaker day by day, God's resurrection power was being manifested in his life, pointing people to God as the sur- source. Verse 7 but we have this treasure in jars of clay, that is, decaying, weak, outer bodies, to show that the surpassing power that strengthens us in our weakness belongs to God. Gordon Fee, a New Testament scholar, says it like this, It is always the bottom line for whom God's power can be manifest only in the visible and extraordinary ways who never consider that God's great power rests on the manifestation of his grace and power through the weakness of the human vessel, precisely so that there is no confusion as to the source. Reason number two is that in all of Paul's suffering, he experienced more of the life of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life, that being eternal life, of Jesus also may be manifested in mortal flesh. And so it seems that the more Paul was afflicted, the more that he experienced the eternal life of Christ. The third reason is that though Paul was suffering greatly, the people of God were not only encouraged in their faith, but grew stronger in their faith, praising and giving glory to God. He says in verse 15, For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Reason number four is that although Paul's physical body was wasting away, his spirit was being renewed and transformed daily. 2 Corinthians 4.16, he says, Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. And so what Paul is saying in that verse is that his suffering was not only transforming him more and more into the image of Christ, which was his main concern in his life, but at the same time, he was continually getting a glimpse of what was to come. By knowing Christ and experiencing his presence in a, dip, dif- or a deeper way. Uh, when I was reading this passage this week in preparation for today, the first person that came to my mind was Bill Gurney. Most of you knew who he was. And... Um, I saw Bill for the last time about a week before he went home to be with Christ. And what he said to me changed my life forever. I mean, perhaps at the time it was kind of a stupid question to ask. But I asked Bill how he was doing. And what I meant was, how was he doing spiritually? And he understood what I was saying and simply said, yeah, physically this sucks. But spiritually, it's never a bad day. And after that, I, had never, I have never looked at physical suffering the same. And as many of you experienced while ministering to Bill, you can all agree that as Bill's body deteriorated, his spirit grew stronger daily. Reason number five um, is that Paul had an eternal perspective which sustained him through his daily suffering, and in fact, made his present suffering seem light in comparison to what was to come. 
verses 17 and 18, he says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the, to the things that are unseen. And this is where Romans chapter 8, verse 18 comes into view. When Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so the analogy that Paul uses is that if you were to put on one side of a scale all your suffering in this life and then put the eternal weight of glory that is waiting for you on the other side, the balance of the scale tips way over on the side of eternal glory. So what is this glory that Paul is speaking about? It's what Jesus prayed to the Father moments before he hung on the cross. John 17, verse 21, he says... Father, I desire that they who will also suffer may be with me where I am in eternity to see my glory. It's experiencing the full presence of Christ every second of every day, forever in eternity, and never doubting his love for you or feeling condemnation or shame or guilt or bitterness or anger or fear or anxiety. It's never feeling pain or having disease-ridden bodies or frustration at work. It's never seeing um, natural disasters or wars or death forever and ever. Only everlasting joy and peace and pleasure beyond what we can imagine. And as John says in Revelation 21, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away, and we will all sing together. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. Okay, so there's some reasons that Paul can say his suffering is not only light, but not worth comparing to what is to be revealed to us when Jesus returns. Now, I know that's not always easy, and what I'm not saying is that if you do step one, step two, step three, or step four, you're never going to feel pain or suffering, nor would Paul. What Paul is saying and trying to show us is that there is hope and purpose in all of it. And maybe you're sitting here today and you're thinking, well, that all sounds great, but right now I'm not there. I can't see my suffering as light in comparison to what you just described. And it's okay to think that, by the way. So what I wanted to end with was some application for our lives in hope that it will help us have some comfort as we persevere through our suffering. So number one, your suffering is not in vain. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor, the Greek word being kopos, meaning the enduring of pain which produces extreme fatigue as you walk in the path of obedience to Christ, is not in vain. It's not meaningless. God sees everything, and he will repay and restore everything that you have suffered in this life. Psalm 56, verse 8 says, You have kept, or you have kept, my, sorry, you have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Joel chapter 2, verses 25 to 26 says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Number two is we're not left alone in our suffering. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes. 
Literally, he is working on your behalf, empowering us to endure with groanings too deep for words. The picture that Paul is, is giving us here is that the Holy Spirit is intimately connected with your pain. It's like someone who is bending over in agony as they feel what the other person is feeling. And the last thing is that we have a sympathetic high priest. Jesus feels and also shares in our suffering. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 15 to 16 says, For we do not have a sympathetic high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in the time of need. John Piper says, says it this way in his book, 50 Reasons Why Christ Suffered and Died. Christ became our priest by the sacrifice of himself on the cross. He is our go-between with God. His obedience and suffering were so perfect that God will not turn him away. Therefore, if we go to him, God will not turn us away either. He endured the full pressure of temptation, temptation and suffering to the end and never caved. He knows what it is to be tempted and suffer with fullest force. A lifetime of temptation, climaxing in spectacular abuse and abandonment gave Jesus an unparalleled ability to sympathize with tempted and suffering people. No one has ever suffered more, no one has ever endured more abuse, and no one ever deserved it less or had a greater reason to fight back. This is amazing. The risen Son of God in heaven at God's right hand with all authority over the universe feels what we feel when we come to him in sorrow and pain. Um, for me, that right there is great encouragement. Um, I don't know if some of you know this, but I weekly suffer with anxiety and um, sometimes depression. And so for me, um, knowing that Jesus went through what I went through uh, and suffered in the same way and even greater uh, gives me great courage to come to Christ. And not only that, it gives me um, joy knowing that when I cross over into the next life, there won't be any more suffering or anxiety or depression. And so, um, yeah, if you're here today and you're not really sure about all this or if you want some prayer, um, there's some people here that want to pray with you and uh, help you in your time of need. So I don't know if Dennis, do you have a, a song or is he here? Uh, is there anyone from the ministry team that can come up the front and help pray with people? Or, yeah, Claire. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. <laughs>